Welcome and thanks for joining us today. <laughs> uh, today I'm going to talk about data navigation with Python 3. Uh, just before I go here, let me take this off. Okay. And first slide, just a little bit about me. My name is Wilker. I am currently live in Sao Paulo and I'm working as a software engineer in People Saúde, which we do like health products for our business here in Brazil. I'm maintainer of the Python library. That's the library I'm gonna be talking about today. And uh, you can find me on this Slack close areas as Wilker Lucio and Wilker Lucio at Twitter. So um, before we enter in any of Python subject, I wanna go back and I'm gonna talk about the problem that I see mostly with our APIs and in general, the way we deal with information, how we traverse information, how we navigate information. And to make this, uh, um, this case, I'll bring an example using Twitter. And, um, and with Twitter, I'll bring the problem of container types. That's the problem I'm gonna focus. And I'm gonna describe more about that in a bit. So, to Think about data navigation. When I think about that, it's just that uh, most of our processes, let's say an HTTP handler, it's always about you get some input data and that's usually go, gonna flow to a controller function and you're gonna use that ID, for example, to fetch some more data. And maybe when you, what you read from the DB is enough, maybe it's not, maybe you're gonna still process more of that data. And those steps is what I'm calling data navigation. So for instance, uh, if you want to render uh, this part of a tweet, like the Twitter have on its own page, we can see that we can start from a tweet ID. That's that's our information source. That's what the information that we have available when we enter that part. And then we want to get all this other data here. So we can illustrate. So you're going to find something. You're going to write a handler. It's going to probably hit a DB or something like that. The problem is how we do that, because in most um, architectures in the way I see, we use, always use this concept of container type. And what I mean by container type is that when you want to ask for this information, you're gonna ask for a name, for a type of something. That could be like a real type, or that could be just a URL that outputs a bunch of fields. The ma what matters is that we are always pointing to this kind of generic type. So let's say if we want to define a type for this response here, for the data we see on screen. So I could list the type tweet and I have some of the data there, but this page is not only about the tweet. If we look at the upper part, we also have information about the, the user that made the tweet. So we have two different entities here in that sense. And we have that user there and the, with the second red box inside. And for that, we're going to create another type for the user type. And now we kind of have our perfectly mapping of what we need on the screen and in any kind of type system generically. The problem is like, for this case, it seems like perfect, right? We're using every attribute we mentioned. We can make everything like say that is required because if we're just thinking about rendering this screen, this this like, it fits like a glove. The problem is that as we evolve systems, we end up needing different representations of those types. And that could be in terms of UI, like we're seeing here, but it could be in terms of operation as well, if you wanna send an email or something. And to show some different representations of a user on Twitter, we can look at it here. So inside of the tweet, we had just that. Or if you look at the relevant people that shows right on the side, we got two more pieces of information required here. We also need the user description. We also need to know if we're following that user. So this is not covered on our original type, but let's keep it that way. What about rendering a page with a full user? If we look at that, then we start to see a lot more data. And we could try to, wait, what happened? Okay, yeah. We could try to use, and now we can see on the screen, we have three different representations of the user. Oops, Some, oh, sorry, something went a bit weird here. 
Sorry, let's replay this. But okay. Okay, something is not responding properly here. But okay, one of the ways we can solve this problem is by creating a type that has all the fields in all the views here, okay? And I'm gonna call this pattern a fat type approach because we're just getting the same type, the same definition of what a user is. And we are spreading around, growing it as we need more information for other parts of the system. And that is actually the approach that the Twitter API v1 uses. So let's take a look for, if we call the JSON API for, for Twitter, and that's the URL, and we want to render that tweet, this is the information we need, the ones you see in the box. But now, the green ones are all the information you get that you are not using to render that page. And I like to emphasize that this is, a, this is the data that comes if you ask for a tweet. Doesn't matter if you just wanna use one or two fields, you're always gonna get there. And semantically, that's what fat types in general, when you grow types, you end up having. We end up having a lot of um, fields that are not relevant to most operations, because every operation that you mention, a user is just gonna use a few fragments of it, but you still are sharing this definition. So you don't know actually what's gonna be used on that operation. Also, it's also it makes harder and harder to make fields required on this type, because if you make something required, that means every operation that mentions this would also want this to be required. And it's just an illustration about the other parts, about how much data you are using and how much you're not there. And on the relevant people, it's even less. Okay, so if we don't wanna have this problem of over-representative, uh, over-representing what we need, what we can do. And a second approach is that before we had multiple views, our types were perfectly fit for one view. So we could just create different types for every representation we have, right? So if we have specific type definitions, if specific content types that I'm calling these types, they aggregate other fields inside of them. Uh, for the closure side, you can think of these types or be like maps in general. So if we have, we could do that and that's a precise definition of it. But what is the problem of doing this? Uh, the first clear problem is that we have to do a lot of repetition on these fields. But the most important problem for me is that we can't deterministically know that those fields represent the same thing. For instance, if we look at user screen name that we can see everywhere, if we just, if you get two types like the tweet user at tweet sidebar, and let's say we call it X and Y, and you see screen naming both of them, can you say with sure, with certainty that those screen names represent the same thing, the same semantic value? Or with an even more clear example, if those two types have a field ID, can you tell if those IDs represent the same thing? If they have the same semantic value, you can use them. And the answer in this case is no, right? Because they are just fields inside of a map, like they don't have a direct connection to them. And that's kind of the problem with this that I'm gonna call the type explosion approach because we just, go creating a bunch of these different definitions, cloning properties to make them suit a specific case. And a typist might say, okay, the problem is that you're not, you're not modeling it right. You have to use the things we learned from object-oriented programming to make this modeling right. Okay, let's, let's try to do some of that. So first, let's see that for this specific example we had, we can see that the Twitter sidebars is like a superset of Twitter user. And user is a superset of sidebar user. So using my object-oriented modeling hat, we could do this, right? So I can say that a sidebar user extends a Twitter user 
and the user extends the sidebar union. And in this case, we fix the problem of not knowing that they represent the same thing because we have only have now one representation for each of the fields we're talking about. The problem with this approach is that this is kind of brittle. Like, for instance, let's say I want to add a status count only for the sidebar. Uh, what happens now? I can't just do it there because anything that I do with sidebar user is going to affect uh, everybody that extends sidebar user. So now we kind of get back in that situation where we have more stuff that we need. But okay, we can do better than that. We can use interfaces. And using interfaces, we may get to something like this. And with this, we could have a base user and we have the Twitter user. We can have the sidebar user implementing Twitter user and providing its own fields and sidebar user interfacing there. And finally, the user can in implement both interfaces and add its own thing. And to me, that starts looking like chaos already, but also like the semantics of these names, they don't mean anything. They are just a very specific uh, design we made to cover these specific scenarios. And as scenarios grow, these will get more and more complicated. And every refactor here requires moving around, creating new interfaces and all this mesh and mesh. And if we wanna really go deep in like say, no, I'm gonna use interface and I'm gonna make it in a way that I can more easily extend and I more easily can use every single piece of attribute. And if we go in that direction, um, Oh, just before you go, this is what I call the fractal type approach because it just keep spreading and spreading and spreading types and interfaces. But another thing we can do is we could create an interface for every single attribute we have. And then for every type we want, we can just implement all those interfaces, right? So now we have uh, every piece that information we want very isolated and you can reuse. And to me, this is madness. Like uh, what, what we're getting through here. And to show that this problem happens like uh, on the wild, if we look at the Spotify API, you're gonna see that they have something called a track object. But if you look at the album, the type of album in a track object is a simplified album object. And they also have the simplified track object and the simplified artist object. So when you start creating this simple that, like account without user, account with this and that, like we create all these names all over the place. And another example, we can see that on YouTube that has a, like this three-step reference. So if I wanna get a video title on YouTube, I needed to know that I need to hit that endpoint I need to know that there is ca categories in every endpoint and that the video title is on a category named snippet. So you need all these pieces. You just want a video title, but it adds all these requirements that are usually there just to get more efficiency for the provider of the API. And last but not least, if we go for YouTube API V2, Apparently, Twitter was not liking to send all these bags of data for everyone all the time. So they decided to do something different. And in the Twitter API v2, when you ask for a tweet, that's all you get. And if you wanna get more, then you need to write URLs like that. And I'll just write it a bit easier for you to read here. So you have to specify the fields of the tweets if you want a field from the user, you have to specify that in a different parameter. And you also have to know that to get the user, you have to have an extend, expansion to the author ID. Okay, and finally, you can get this data here. And my point is, all this intermediate stuff we're talking about, they are kind of irrelevant for the problem, right? But you still have to do that. And let's do a comparison a bit of of choices that every of these APIs made. So on Twitter, if you want, they choose for convenience 
They have few endpoints that have huge payloads, no matter what you want. Twitter v2 requires small payloads, but it adds a lot of, it, it keeps adding complexity to get to the data. You have to know more details about how they internally organized that. Spotify got more of a balanced result, but he did that by having to replicate and create more of those type explosion things. And on the YouTube, they also invented the own thing on soap parts and YouTube never gets your related entities. So they don't have to create simple video entity or simple user or things like that. So when I look at those APIs and it's worth notes, like these are industry leaders. These are people that know what they are doing, right? They are experienced developers and they are using the best we know to create those APIs, but they are using these things. They're all based on this, on these intermediate names. There are the container names. And by trying to forcing ourselves to model those names gets us all in this context, constant balance that we have to fight if we want something that's convenient or if we have, want to have something that's efficient. Also, because of that, every API here is ad hoc. Like I can't have a central thing that we use all these APIs at the same time because each one of them defines its own language and its own way to get stuff. So to navigate then you have to write specific implementations. And a lot of those, like even when you start learning in using the API, you have to keep coming back to documentation pages because uh, you need to remember how they how they how they do solve it. And this one, this next slide is just a little parenthesis for people that do understand GraphQL or use it already. And I want to say just that GraphQL doesn't solve this problem because GraphQL, although, although it solves the problem on the client side, like the clients now can navigate, can have introspection, and can ask specifically what they want. The, for the people that are implementing these GraphQL services, they still have to deal with all this type madness we saw before. They still have, for example, is a common practice on GraphQL that the read types will become the fat types that I talked about, huge in scope, because you want to read the max as you can for the single entity, while the write types will have the type explosion thing, where you define a new type for every mutation operation you do. So you end up having partially both problems. And to me, that's really, that's really a problem of referencing is because we're choosing to reference those big names like a URL or a type, a specific type when you return something. And I wanna show you there is, there is another way to do that. And if we get back to this view, before we start writing any types, it starts star, before we start trying to put names on boxes, on parts, on, on collections of information, we can see that this image, we can per perfectly describe everything the page needs. And we can even, even see things like uh, the screen name here. It's the same screen name here, okay? And I don't show that one before, but so, what if we don't give names to any of the container types, right? What if we just get each attribute that we make and consider the attribute itself to be the interface? The attribute by itself is what defines the content, like what you expect from it. And by the image, we can see, we can kind of describe that. And you can also follow, see the same images across the place. So it's like going to that path of implementing all the interfaces, but you don't need to implement any. You just put the names of the attributes and use that, that directly. So if for anybody that's not familiar with kind of this idea, I wanna show what that looks like if we work directly with attributes, what it looks like if we don't do this anymore. And for an exercise, we're gonna use this Twitter screen here. There is, um, let's say we want to render this page. Okay. And I'll increase the size. I really want to increase the size here. Yeah. Okay. Let's say we want to get the data to fetch this page. 
how do we do that if we're living in a world of attribute modeling, in a world that we're not talking about the names of the boxes? And to show you this demo, I'm going to load something that I did here. Beto. So the question now is not anymore like, what are the endpoints I have to call to get this information? The question is, what data do you have and what data do you want? So let's start by the data we have. We have an idea of a tweet. So let's start here and provide that data as a tweet ID. And I'm gonna paste the tweet ID here. And now what information I want, let's see. We can start by wanting the username. So if I type here username, I can see there is an attribute called Twitter username. If I want the verified, I can do that and screen name. And I keep going over profile, image URL. I want the text of the tweet. I want the created ad. I'll not keep exhausting myself, but you just start putting the data you want one by one. And then you run and ask for the data. And of course, it's gonna do an error because the gods of demos don't wanna help me today. Um, let's see, I just ran this here. So yeah, okay. Ah, I remember which one is that. That user. Okay, I'm not gonna debug that now. I know this one's working. So this is the idea. So the idea is that now you have a system that you can just ask for the information and kind of not care about what it came from, what frame it's from. Because really for the use case you want, it doesn't matter. And another interesting thing about this, uh, let's see, I can see that request here that I did. So we can also see what happened here. So to get this, we just trigger our get tweet and the get tweet hit that endpoint and get the information. And the way we can implement stuff like this with Python, and that's where Python gets in, Python is about mapping relationships between attributes. When you enter this word and you wanna create definitions, you create definitions in terms of attributes. So you can say things like, if I wanna get a tweet, I can say, okay, if I provide you a tweet, you should be able to get me all this data because this is the data that's returned from the tweet endpoint, that view one that just bursts out of information. So I tell Patton, okay, Patton, if you give me a tweet ID, I can give you all this data here. And we can do something similar to the user. So let's see if I wanna ask in here a uh, user screen name and I say like Twitter itself. And I wanna know the username of that. I can get Twitter. Uh, what if I want the timeline? I can use something like recent timeline. And what do I want from the timeline? I want the tweet text and when it was posted. And there you go. We can see it went and did the request. So, and now we have the recent timeline. So this is kind of a way to allow us to navigate. And if you're not familiar with the syntax, this is kind of borrowed initially from the atomic, but that means these attributes I want, and this is a join, we call a join. And I'm saying, oh, for the recent timeline, I want this data specifically, each of these data points. And this is what it kind of feels like to navigate in a world that, uh, of attributes. And the names of the functions don't matter anymore or the names of containers of the types because you can be precise and specific. And another interesting thing here is that what if I want to extend this, let's say, let's say I want to get the tweet URL. Like I wanna, I wanna get a link for that tweet. Right now it's gonna do an error because that definition doesn't exist in my system. But what I wanna show you is how how it looks like to extend a system once you have that. So we know that to create a tweet URL, we need the, the ID of the tweet. I can even see like a tweet status here. So this is the example, the same one I was showing to you. So 
we need the username and we need the ID of the of the tweet. So we can extend the system, create a new resolver there. I got a call uh, tweet URL. And I'm gonna say that for a tweet URL, we need the tweet ID and we need the user screen name, okay? And by this, I'm gonna output an attribute called Twitter tweet um, browser. I'm gonna call this browser URL or what's the name that I gave it here? Tweet URL, let's call it tweet URL. And we can compute that by just making a concatenation here of, um, oops. so we replace this part with the screen name and you replace this part with the ID. And we tell Python that we wanna use that resolver in that system. And we load again. And if we come to the two and refresh indexes, we should be able to see the tweet URL here. And of course, it doesn't want to help me today. I'm sorry, folks. I hear all of this, but of course the, uh, ah, okay. No. He was complaining about the screen name. <clears throat> yeah, I guess it was about, uh, okay. I really don't want to stop you the bug there. I just hope you believe me that this, <laughs> in normal circumstances work. Uh, but the screen name, I'm just gonna do one quick debug here just to see one thing. Yeah. Um, oh, wait a moment. I now, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I did a fix on Python 3 while I was doing this and I was trying to use the version that's published and I forgot to update it here or something. I promise this is the last time I'm gonna try to do this. If that doesn't work, I'll give up on that part. Oh, that loads, let me see. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no. Okay, I'll debug that later. I'm pretty sure if I do that, it's gonna work. Nope, nope. Okay, please believe me that that part's working. <laughs> Should work. I'll promise that I'll keep, uh, I'll, I'll share all this code after, and I promise that I'll get it fixed for you and I'll let you know when it's fixed. Okay, let's keep going. And Another interesting part about this, uh, having this uh, disconnection between what do you want and what do you run is that you can change the underlying thing and keep the query working. So for instance, uh, this query that we see here before, okay. Oh, hmm. <laughs> let me try one thing real quick. Ah, that was the problem. <laughs> it wanted a string here. Okay, <laughs> wrong data types. Yeah, let's see if that our tweet URL works. Yes, it does. Okay, good. I'm not completely broken today. Okay, and that's the point. And what's quite nice about uh, right working a system like that is that you're never worried about what is the user, what do I depend? Every single operation you write can depend exactly and precisely on the data you need to compute that operation. And you can create other operations that derive from that. For instance, if I wanna create a, I don't know, visit message here that depends on a tweet URL,
we could create something like this that, that has a string saying, go visit my tweet, tweet at tweet URL. And is it message? Oops. Oh, yeah. So visit message. And if we come here, restart and use the visit message. Okay. So that attribute you just created becomes a new entry point in the system where other parts of the system can depend on that name. And here you can even see the chain of calls with the pattern this. Oh, in pattern this, by the way, sorry, I skipped that. This is a tool that you can use to assist the developing with pattern. Uh, it has this uh, features like autocomplete for queries and uh, tracing and uh, all this nice stuff that can help you understand what's going on in your system. And you can even have the index explorer so you can see all the attributes there are on the system and how they relate to each other. Okay, so now continue. I was talking to you about uh, data evolution. What happens when you need to change the underlying system or for what, uh, change how it does it. So let's say you wanna migrate from the Twitter API if you want to the V2. We could come here and this is kind of the same stuff, but it, this time it is implemented using the API V2 of Twitter. I'm not going to go into the details of the implementation, but what is really important here, uh, and I should just come here and watch later, is if I get the same query here. Okay, these are pretty much the same query. Let's just see. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm not cheating. I can get the exact same query and run against API v2 and get the same response but now I'm using an API that's more efficient than before. And I can prove some of that to you by like, uh, by going here on the tweet. And there is some code that I made here to get just the data you want, you need. So I'm gonna preprint the field params, which is like what I'm requesting exactly from that tweet request. And if we do that uh, using this one here, we can see that, okay, I need it from the user, I need those fields. For the tweet, I need those fields. But let's say what happens if I say, I don't want the profile URL or the verified part. Now I'm making a request that's not using them. And the, the most important thing here is that, it's like, I'm not putting this burden of making this uh, internal knowledge to the user. My user only needs to know the attribute names it wants. It doesn't need to know how it's gonna affect that. So for instance, if I took user completely here, you're gonna see like we get the expansions out, we get the Twitter out. So it can have the most efficient uh, process for the specific request you need. Okay. So now I wanna move to a part where we play with just straight pattern. What happens when you're playing like um, just using pattern and not having to just connect the other sources. So far I show you how you can kind of use pattern to transform something that uses the container types logic and ideas to something that's attribute based. But what if you make your system attribute based from the start, what that looks like? And to do that, I'm gonna show you this example. This is in Portuguese because it's a order, an email that I got from an order of a food delivery service. And I wanna imagine like, if we want to create the function, a function call that would send this email to, to a customer, what that would, could look like in terms of data retrieval. That's what we're focusing today. And the way you could do this is by having this method for send order. And to get the data, you're gonna pull the order ID from some parameter and you're gonna run a query asking for all the data. And here's how you can map this data to the page. So we start having some order ID. 
we also have to use the order ID there. So it's also part of the query. And you can keep going one by one. We have the name, we have the state of the delivery that's like a, it's a waiting transport. And for the line items, we have that join thing we talked about where we can have internal attributes for those. And then you can map those attributes to each part. We have a discount, we have the items total, we have the grand total, phone, and et cetera. So we are going to implement this piece by piece, okay? And to start it, we're gonna get there later. So let's start by having the customer part. So I'm gonna just use mock data on this example, but you can imagine this could be coming from a database or other service or anything else. So here I'm gonna have one resolver that says that says that if I given if I give me an Acme user ID, I should be able to get this data from the user. And we can test this here. And okay, if I ask first and last name, I got my first and last name. Cool. That's it for this one. Now let's see the next part. So now we have some data from the line items. And the line items is the part that knows which items you ask about the order in that part. So we have a resolver here that takes the order ID. That's the same order ID we place here. And there's two line items with an ID, quantity, and price. So we can ask for things, for instance, uh, for at that order, the line items, the price total. And you can get the total price of every item on the order. If we change the number just for the sake of breaking, it's gonna give you an error because now it could not fetch what you wanted. The next piece, and before I go on, I think it's nice to go to the other slide, but I'm gonna do it in a window mode. So we're gonna do this one. Oh, let's go to the next slide straight. Okay. So let's fulfill the order. And for this, I, I, wanna, I wanted to show you what it kind of looks like internally in the terms of pattern to do the operation. So this is based on the same query you've seen before. So on the left, we have the order ID, that's the data we have available. And on the right side is the data we need. And this considering the nested input in this case, just simplify. So for the order ID, we already have the order ID. We don't have to do anything. But you get the first name, we also need to get the user from the user ID. So that's that resolver that gets the user and the type. But we can't, we don't have a user ID yet. So we also need something that gets the user ID and makes this flow happen. So we need this resolver here, order by ID. And you can find it in this namespace where you have here order by ID and parts of the responses that it gets to the user ID. So by having the user ID, it can connect on the other resolver that can get the first name and spit on the response. If we keep going for the delivery state is already here as well. But for line items, we see that we need that other resolver that gets us the line items. So now we are connecting. Now we need to go for the delivery fee that's already here on the order by ID. So you can reuse that. The discount we can also reuse from that. The items total, this is an interesting one because this needs the line items. We need to compute from the line items, the sum of all the items there. That would be the items total. And we need another resolver to do that. And that's this resolver here, which calculate the items total. So it asks for line items and the price total of each line item. Again, very precise definitions, very close to the data you want. And we, we're using that, we can calculate the total. We also want to calculate the grand total, which depends on that total we computed here, the delivery fee plus the delivery fee minus the discount. So we need another resolver that connects all these pieces together. And finally, for the CPF and phone, it's something you already have here. And that's how kind of Patton processes your request. Patton looks at what the data you need 
and start to looking for what resolvers can, can satisfy this data and starts blocking, creating these chains of calls to, um, to fulfill your data for you. And we can see this running. I have an example here where, uh, as you may see on those, I just create a variable that has called registry that has all resolvers for each namespace that we navigated. And here on this monolith that I'm calling, I am going to, to do a query. I'm gonna integrate all those resolvers and I'm gonna run the query that we see before. And fair enough, by doing this query, Peton is gonna do that procedure, connect everything together and generate your response. Now, this is something I kind of promised on my last talk in the conch that it's something I really wanted to work on. That's distributed computing using Peton. Um, the example I just showed to you shows like everything, all the resolvers are running on the same machine, right? They, they share the same environment and they com can communicate with each other by memory and stuff like that. But what if I wanted something different? What if we wanted a microservices architecture to solve the same problem? And we want to involve like four different services. That's going to be products, orders, customers, inline item service. Okay. What if I want to use that? So in a pattern architecture, what it would be nice to do is have is to have something that's a federator that's sitting be, behind all those services. So the client can run a query to the federator and the federator will distribute that query across the different services and fulfill the data in a distributed manner. And that's what we, we're gonna see now. So we are going from this, the monolith we've seen before, to this, right? We're gonna break some of these services around. Uh, the product's not here because it's nested, but it's the same idea. And what we want is for Peton to get that and make this happen. And that's my federator example here. So in this case, this is similar to that monolith setup, but this time for every each namespace that I show you here, I'm starting an HTTP server that only has the resolvers of that namespace. So if you follow like the customer's end here, you're gonna see that end has the registry with their user by ID. And the other ones will do the same. The end for the order only have the registry for the order. So we start the servers and now we start Peton connecting those servers. And I'm saying, hey Peton, I wanna pull, I wanna pull something that's running on a remote service. And this HTTP handler is gonna return a function that can be called with queries and you're gonna respond with data. And Peton is gonna, um, one of the things these handlers can do is that you can ask Peton about what it knows. I can show you that here. If I say, for example, indexes, I can ask Peton, what do you know? And this is gonna give you the index of the attributes and relationships and everything. So internally, Peton is gonna absorb each of those index of each of the services running and is going to integrate in a single one on the federator. And now when you run the query on the federator, it's going to automatically do all the distribution. So what you can see here is that, yeah, you can see it happening here. So it's a bit small, but yeah. So you can see all the requests. So it asks the line items to get some data and use data to com compute the items total. Uh, to compute the user information, you had to ask the orders. So you have to ask the user ID from the orders and it gets it together and full, fill it up. And just a caveat, this is very new stuff. So I, I expect this to have some bugs and I hope People are interested in try so you can find those bugs sooner than later and fix it up. Okay. 
let me go back to my presenting mode. So what I was trying to show you here is that there are, oh, sorry, today, full screen. So using attribute different architecture, you can both do something like this, where you have just a single server with a single DB and you have attributes, you ask then, you get response back. You can have something like a server that one single server that has multiple DBs and you have resolvers that are spreading things around. Or you can even go more crazy and you have an architecture that have multiple services and multiple databases and things going on. And what's cool about this, and that's, that's the main point I'm trying to convey for you in this talk is that by putting something, a layer of attributes and make your clients ask just the attributes, not the names of endpoints, you can mix and match those architectures without, without giving a big impact on your clients. Because your clients, your attributes in your system, they tend to be stable. Different from the container types, like we've seen that you end up creating simple this, uh, complex that, attributes remain stable as your system grows and you can keep reusing them and you can change how they are implemented and you're not gonna get a lot of penalty in that you're not gonna have the burden of so much refactoring as we do. So just uh, notes on leaving on attribute design from something I've been doing this for about three years and something now. So these are some takeaways I take from using those. So by doing this, you can express your data needs directly and precisely. So you don't need to spend time spend time thinking about container type names or how to rearrange your types in the best way that will fit all your cases of your system. You don't have to do any interface madness to reuse stuff. You can easily extend this at any point. And if the code works, you can support distributed computing very easily. And one that I, yeah, and for that you can use Python to connect attributes. And one thing that I didn't mention here, but it's also really new is that because you're delegating the control of the calling of the functions, a library like Python can also optimize that. So recently I released the parallel processor on Python tree, which means that if you have resolvers and things that could run in parallel, they will run in parallel automatically for you. And you don't have to even think about the coordination. You only think about your small procedures. And that's what I wanted to talk to you. I hope you guys are excited about the idea of attribute modeling. Pattern is just a way to do that. But I think the this design is what could take us to a much better place. And that's where I had today. Thank you. <laughs>